When I was asked to speak on on the 14th of Feb, I thought, have I got to do a Valentine's Day theme thing? And I tried to think about it, but I just it didn't really come. So whether you wanted it or not, I'm sorry, or you're relieved, it's all good. What I do want to talk to you about today is having a triumphant faith in, in troubling times. I'd also say I'm preaching from Romans again. I've noticed I preach from Romans a lot. I do read other books of the Bible. <laughs> I do just want to make that clear. But for me, Romans is such a good book. They're all good, obviously, but there's so much stuff in here. And I, I've actually kind of, I was looking over notes from another thing I did, and I'm going to be saying a few things again, but it's the truth of the Word of God. And uh, I'm just going to pray. Father, I'm, we're opening your Word together because we want to grow in our understanding of who you are and everything you've accomplished for us. So as we read your word, would you speak to us? Would you let your truth seep in and take root? And for those who are hearing it for the first time, would you open their hearts to your your word as it speaks into their lives? Amen. I'm going to jump in at Romans 5, um, but it starts with a therefore. And as we all know, when you see a therefore, you have to ask what it's there for. So what I'm going to try and do is try and summarize four chapters worth of theologically, theologi- that really clever word, theology-packed um, verses in a short space of time. It's the match of the day of Romans, if you will. Okay. And before we do that, I just want to clarify a few terms, because I'm reading from the New King James today. Um, there's a few words which I'll try and uh, clarify, because even I had to look them up. Um, not that it makes me sound clever. I have to look up a lot of things, to be honest. But um, just to clarify some terms, when we talk about being justified, we're talking about being declared righteous by God, being made righteous by God. To be righteous is to be in the right with God, conforming to his will, meeting his perfect standard. If we are justified, we are made righteous and therefore comply with these standards. But there is a problem, and this is what I want to talk about. Because in the first four chapters where Paul's outlining his gospel to a church he's never visited, though he's got links there, Paul writes that we are all in the wrong, or have been in the wrong, uh, with God. No one meets his standard, and as a result, we're all facing his wrath, his extreme anger. Okay, not a trifling thing, it's his wrath, it's, and it's his judgment as well. Chapter 1, um, starting there, we learn that his wrath is burning against us because of sin. It's our unrighteousness, okay? He explains that the truth of God is made known to all people in verse 20, which I'll just read now. So th- I'll just, I'm going to hop around a bit. Um, But uh, chapter 1, verse 20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so his divine nature, so that they are without excuse. Despite the fact that all people know God, whether they've been in a church church before or not, God's God's nature, his very self, is is revealed in the creation we are all a part of. Okay, so we all have some idea of God. The Bible tells us that no one's got an excuse. We can't say, well, I didn't know, which is such a, you know, well, there you are, it's in here. (laughs) And we've all at some stage chosen not to honor God, but chosen to seek ourselves, rebelling, falling short of his standard. Like I've just said, for those who haven't read the Bible, who, who don't know who Jesus is, never heard of him, or even if they haven't got a religious sort of upbringing or anything, they can't plead ignorance because God's law or his standard or some aspects of it are written sort of hardwired into our consciences. That's it. That is, we were designed and made with an inbuilt sense of what God would require of us. Moving on. Um, We stand essentially before God as guilty. Another way of looking at it is we are essentially God's enemies at this stage. We are at war with him, with his his way and our way. We are in conflict. 
even those who tr are moral people who try really hard to do good deeds and try and be a good person, even they would fall short of God's standard because God's standard is, is perfect. It is it, one slip up and that's it. It sounds really hard and really heavy and high, but that is what it is. God is perfect. It's not a question of being religious or just turning up to church every week either because God looks beyond out the outside appearances, looks beyond what we might appear to do and considers what's going on in our hearts, in our thoughts and all these things. Yeah. It comes to a conclusion in, Paul, in chapter 3 in a way where Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one can ever be made right by trying to keep God's law because, as I've just said, they won't be able to meet the perfect standard. All the law does in this regard ends up showing us our sin and that we fall short. And the result is that all of humanity, from Adam and Eve in the garden, throughout history to modern day, stood guilty before God, awaiting the judgment and his coming wrath. A really bleak picture. But, there's a but, thankfully. God in his mercy is delaying that day of judgment for as long as possible because he wants to give us all that opportunity to respond to the love and the grace he's shown us through Jesus Christ. And I want to, we're going to pick up um, in Romans chapter 3. I'm going to read from verse 21. Um, so, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, all have, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation in other words, you could look at it as like a sacrificial offering. Who God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God makes a way for us to be declared right with him without having to keep that law which no one could keep in, their, in themselves. God is a holy and just God. He is righteous. He is perfect. His standards are perfect. And like with any law, if it is judged to have been broken, there's consequences. There needs to be justice. When we see a law broken in our society, we want to see justice. And when we don't see it, we may well feel, feel aggrieved. And it's the same with God's law. The Bible tells us God is love. And while his wrath burns against our sin, his love for, for you as a person, as a human being, has never diminished, has never fallen, has never risen. It is just a constant, all out, I love you. And that will always be the case. But God's law needs to be upheld. Otherwise, God would have to compromise on those standards. So there's a dilemma. How can the judgment of God's wrath being poured out on a sinful humanity, which God loves, be averted? How can this judgment we are due be avoided? And the answer is Jesus Christ. Okay? Because Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead has now meant humanity has a way of being made right in the eyes of God. To become justified by faith, okay, by believing in what Jesus has done for us. Not by earning it, not by any effort of man, but just believing in what Jesus has done for us. Made righteous, made to be in the right by faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 tells us that for he made him, so God made Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
Jesus exchanged our sin for his righteousness on the cross. Jesus was treated by God as if he were a sinner. Though he was perfect and righteous. But because of that, we are treated like we are righteous again by God. Though we were the ones that put Christ on the cross in the first place. The wrath of God fell on Jesus and not us. That, f- that requirement of the law is therefore fulfilled. Regardless of who you are or what you have done, if you come to Jesus, putting your trust, your faith in the fact that his death on the cross was that all-sufficient sacrifice required to pay the death penalty, the consequence of our sin, then we are made right, we are declared righteousness by God through Christ. It's like we're in the courtroom, standing before God, and the judgment's been passed. We are guilty. And there you are. It's the final, the, 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 all the evidence has been laid out. It's been dismissed. We are guilty. Yet, as soon as the judgment is given, and the sentence is declared, God comes down from the judgment seat and takes our place. That's what's going on in the gospel. I find this immense, and I've said something like this before, but I I just want to say, being told you're guilty, being judged to be guilty is not nice, and maybe even as I say it, you're listening and you disagree, and you find it might be something that causes you to get cross or angry. Maybe you're thinking about God's, all these requirements that God's got for me, the way he wants me to live, it's so, it doesn't, you know, it's out of date. God's word's out of date. It doesn't apply today. How can these things, ethical issues, sexuality, your, your worldview, these things may be at odds with God's word? And uh, you might be tempted to say, well, it's, it's not true, but God is perfect. His standard is perfect. And maybe his standards appear to be unattainable, hard, unrealistic, because as we are saved, we are called to live, which we'll come on to, as living sacrifices, following Jesus. The standard hasn't changed. It's just our consequences are paid for. But at the heart of my faith and the heart of our faith is the fact that God incarnate came as Jesus, came into this world that you and I live in, to die on a cross, to release us from that death penalty because he loves us, to restore us to the life that we were intended for in the first place. To have a relationship with God forever. Okay? And the difference is we are given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit which will give us what we need to live God's way. Because we've already established we can't do it on our own. And when we're saved, we still can't do it on our own. We need the helper. We need the Holy Spirit. Okay? And when you become a Christian, you receive the Holy Spirit. And we could talk about that another time, about being filled. But God loves you. I know I feel like I get tired saying it, but I won't get tired saying it. And if this is the first time you've heard it, God loves you. If this is the five hundredth time you've said it, God loves you. Okay, I'm saying it to everyone in this room, those on the cameras. Um, and in many ways, that's all I want to say. God loves you. God's law, God's the, the things in the Bible may, you know, Joe was talking about sin that we we have to give up. Um, you know, things that give us comfort, things we take pleasure in. They may be at odds with what God's calling us to, a life he's calling us to. Let me say there that God calls us to life and life in its full abundance. It might be painful to let go of things. It might be difficult. And I I tell you, I I find there's things in my life I wrestle with letting go of sometimes. But God's way is life to the maximum. 100% 100% without a doubt. The youth, um, we went, we joined online. We did, obviously couldn't go because of lockdown, but we joined online with um, an event Limitless are doing on Friday. It was so good, talking about being followers of the way, followers of Jesus' way. And Tim Elford, who's the director of Limitless, he was speaking, and he said something that really stuck in my mind. He said something along the lines of, the more I follow Jesus, the more I follow his ways, the more alive I feel. So I took that, I was thinking, the more he shuns the old, the things he loved, the things which gave him pleasure but aren't in line with God's word, the more he put 
loving others above himself into practice, the more alive he became. Because God's, the way God called us to be is to love, to love him, love God with everything we've got, and love others, rather than being self-seeking, self-promoting. Because when we go self-seeking, self-promoting, we pursue just the shadow of the glory, of the truth of God. And we might attain it. You might attain it, but you will find that you, it rings hollow in the end. It's only when we go, God, I'm all in. I'm all in. And you'll start to see that this life and all its fullness will rise up. I'm still in the summary. <laughs> um, chapter 4, Paul, I'll just quickly scoot through this because I want to get on to Romans 5. Um, Paul writes about Abraham believing the promise that God gave him that he will have a son. He was about 100 at this time. Um, he, you know, Him and his wife Sarah had hadn't been able to have children before now yet God has said to him I will give you a son and not only that I will make him a great nation Abraham believed that promise and it was credited to him as righteousness and the same way our standing with God is possible because Jesus' righteousness is credited to us because of that exchange on the cross so what does it mean to be justified by faith, which we'll move on to? We are made right with God when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. How did it happen? Jesus Christ died in our place and bore the weight of our sin and the consequence of it, trading our sin for his righteousness. And why did it happen? Because the love of God for you and me and the grace he has towards us. So, with that said and done, I'm going to read from Romans 5, verse 1 to 11. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ with whom we, now, we have now received the reconciliation. We have peace with God through Jesus. We have access by faith into the grace of God, the unmerited favor, the unconditional acceptance of God. We are now free to obey God, not because... We're in our newly restored relationship with him, not to obtain his favor, but very much because we already have that favor. We're responding to him now out of love and for everything he's done for us. And in verse 2, I just want to look at a, t a particular phrase where Paul tells us that we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, in the NLT, this is translated as we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. What is glory? Okay, so I've done a, you know, had a look into um, this is a bit more. And what I've seen is the word for it, um, I think it's the Hebrew word, is doxa. It might be Greek, actually. Um, but nonetheless, we're talking about God's absolute perfection which resides in Christ. It's his splendor, it's his majesty, it's everything good that comes with God. Okay. Um, 
Jesus' miracles would demonstrate God's glory. But God's glory is very much in who he is. We see that glory in part now. But there comes a time when it will be fully revealed and we will get to share in it. Okay? Titus 2 verse 13 tells us that we therefore, having been made right with God, look forward hopefully or look hopefully towards that full revelation. And not only that, we look forward to sharing in it expectantly. If we are in Christ, we will share in his glory. I'm not talking about like earthly or human glory, which is temporal and fades. I'm talking about the everlasting, true glory of God. <clears throat> it's one thing rejoicing in the glory of God and what's to come. It's quite another to rejoice in tribulation or suffering. Okay, so the, the New King James goes with tribulation. Uh, the NLT, NIV, use suffering. Being a Christian doesn't exclude you from, from doing life and everything that comes with it in this fallen world we live in. We will still face trials. We will still suffer. Okay? But the reason we can rejoice in this is because, as, we've, as we read, suffering or tribulations produces perseverance. In terms of our faith, our endurance, our perseverance grows. Um, it's when it's needed most, it's put into action. And that's when it's when under, under, under the stress test, if you will, I don't know. But as we, as we use it, it grows. As our perseverance is tested and grows, so too our character. Our character is developed. And um, a great looking uh, into... My wife's got loads of Greek fancy books. She went to Bible college, so I sometimes just... Ask, ask her things. <laughs> but um, here we're talking about the, the Greek sense is that um, character proven under trial or under stress, you know, and the hope we have in receiving what God has promised in us grows stronger as we endure these things. In James chapter 1, James is writing very much about a similar process, talk, telling us to count it all joy when we fall into various trials, okay, because our faith is tested. It produces patience, uh, patience. Again, other words for that are endurance and perseverance. Um, things are tested to determine if they are sufficient, if they are genuine. Uh, and if, if we press on, we will be found, uh, we will pass that test, is what I'm trying to say. James says, let that patience have its complete work, let it complete its work, that we may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So normal glass, normal float glass, when it breaks, um, as I found recently when I dropped a glass in the kitchen, um, shatters into large, sharp pieces, okay, which are, don't want to tread on them, very dangerous. But you can toughen glass so that when it breaks, it will still shatter, but it will be a lot smaller, blunt pieces. Um, and it's useful for other things and in building and whatever else. You toughen glass for that very reason. But to do that, the glass needs to go into a furnace. And they, these temperatures go over 600 degrees Celsius. Uh, I see, I understand. And as the glass is cooled and the glass contracts back down, it is strengthened. Okay? And the tribulation, the suffering we may go through, may well feel like a furnace. It may be hard and difficult. But when we come through the other side, our faith, our character, our capacity to, to, to endure is stronger. And our, our trust and our hoping for God's promises grows too. Our rejoicing is based upon having God's perspective in our times of difficulty. And even when we can't see his perspective clearly, trusting him regardless, knowing that his will for us is good, pleasing and perfect. Paul has so far explained how we can be sure of what's to come and even joyful of times and trial in this present age. But now he wants to talk about in, far, in this chapter why that, that faith, that confidence is so well placed. And as you look at chapter, verse 5, hope does not disappoint because the love of God 
has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. The Holy Spirit is given to us. The love of God is poured into our hearts. And as we grow as Christians, as we read the Scriptures, as we walk with Him, we will see the love of God in action in our, in our lives, revealed to us as we open up the Word of God and we let it come into us. It's a love that goes beyond warm, fuzzy feelings, though they're nice and they happen to. God can touch our emotions for sure. But we're talking about something deeper. We're talking about something that will give us a confidence to trust in God's promises, even when our emotions are screaming, our circumstances are completely at odds with God's word. But because of our confidence, we stand. It might be provision for a particular need in your life, financially or other, when you need it and God, you see something happen and you're left thinking the only thing, the only cause of this is God. It will happen because of God's love for you. The Holy Spirit given to us is also a spirit of adoption. So just to, if you were to read on to Romans 8, you'd see how uh, the Holy Spirit is given to believers as a spirit of adoption by which we can cry out, Abba, or not the band, but um, another, you know, for us it'd be daddy. You know, we can call God our daddy, which might sound odd. It took me a while to get used to, but I love it now because he is my daddy. He is my father in heaven, my, you know, my spiritual father, the one who made me. The Spirit testifies to us, or is a testament that we, given to us that we are children of God. And if children heirs, and I'd love to talk about that, but I'm trying to keep an eye on the time, so I'm going to move on. But in Romans 8, we read about how um, the sufferings of this age pale in comparison to what's to come. Yeah. In Romans, back to Romans 5, I'm going to stick to what I've written today. God demonstrates his love to us in the fact that he took action on our behalf when we were enemies. We spoke at the, we were at the, said at the start about how we were essentially at war with God. And it was at that moment God demonstrates his love that while we were still sinners, while we were still at odds with him, that's when he died for us. Paul's point is, is this. If while we were enemies of God, Jesus was sent to die for us, how much more, now that we are his friends, his family, um, will he fulfill the promises he gives us? Or put it another way, if he's already gone to that length of trouble for us, he's not going to neglect us going forward. Okay. Our faith is triumphant in troubling times because we are made right with God. No longer at war with him, but at peace. We already enjoy that relationship now that we, with our faith in Jesus, we enjoy that relationship with God and we are assured of that love he has for us. We also know there's more to come. We are confident that what God has promised will happen. We can endure difficulty, suffering, and through it our character is developed, is refined. We become more like Jesus and our hope in these promises grows stronger. We live in a, in a lockdown. It's COVID. There are difficulties and trials around us. We can all relate to, I'm sure. But there are other things. There's disease. There's poverty. There's so many other things. Injustice. Hardships. I could go on. What impact does our ability, our triumphant faith, have in our witness to the world? Uh, well, I, can, I, I believe that people will see us walking in the same trials that they walk through, and they will notice how we cope with it differently because of our perspective, our heavenly perspective, the hope in which we have. And with that, that comes the peace of God, which we, you know, we get when we, when we look to God for all things. And people will be drawn to that. Because when people don't have Jesus, they, they don't have that same assurance. I'm going to conclude because I, I think I'm, I'm pretty, much wrapped, pretty much done. But to say, to conclude then, we see that we've been made right with God. 
Actually, there is one other thing I want to say. Sorry, there's one last thing. Um, what I don't want you to think I'm saying is that I'm trying to lessen or cheapen suffering, because by its very nature, it's hard, and it hurts sometimes. What God isn't saying is, um, you know, chin up, you're getting all these benefits out of me, all right? Um, I'm using them to make your faith stronger, so just put a smile on and forget about it. It's all going to be all right. That's not what I'm saying. I was just listening to, uh, just the radio was on whilst I was getting ready, and uh, I don't know who was on UCB, but he was talking about when Jesus wept and referred to Isaiah when he's called a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. God is not ignorant of your suffering. He is not unaware of what you're going through. He cares, okay? He cares. He will walk through it with you. And, you know, you might feel like he's not there sometimes, but uh, forgive me, I, I think, Martin, you were talking about he will wait for the right time to act sometimes, maybe with healing. Call out to him, cry out to him, because he will hear you. And it is desire to respond to you, to bless you, to deliver you. And there will come a day when Jesus comes back, and there will be no more pain. There will be no more tears. There will be no more death. There will be us and God. And I can't even try and put it into words what I think it but I have no idea. But I trust God it's going to be the best thing because God will be there. And evil won't, frankly. So I'm going to pray um, and I'm going to hand back over to, to the band or Pete, I don't know. But Lord, I want to just say thank you so much for everything you've accomplished on the cross. Whether we're hearing it for the first time or for the you know, the 100th time and beyond. Your truth is so incredible. This truth is so incredible. It's the most important thing that's happened in the history. And we owe you everything for it. You call us to be living sacrifices in view of your mercy, which is our reasonable service. And it is so true. In every light of everything you've done for us, it is reasonable for us to respond and say, God, we give you our lives. We choose to serve you. We choose to live for you. For those that, you know, maybe you're, you're wrestling, you're fighting, and maybe you're, you're, you're finding certain sins really tricky to let go of. Maybe things keep tripping you up. All I want to say is don't give up. Keep coming to God. Keep praying. Keep, don't give up on God. Persevere. These trials have a purpose, and God will get you through it. As you grow, as your understanding of who God is grows, things will change. God loves you, and uh, I want to, again, say... If you don't know Jesus, if you haven't made a decision to follow him, then uh, you know, get in touch with us, drop a message in a chat, or contact the church. Um, for God, you know, one of the most famous, famous verses in the Bible is this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And one, and one I skipped over, but I feel I will just add, is in John 15. Greater love have no man than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. God's not trying to get you in the kingdom just to sort of say, look how many I've got in God. He calls you his friend. And walking with God, walking with Jesus, following Jesus, is what you were made for. And... When we, when we come to that place, that's when we will know life in all its fullness. Thank you, Lord. Amen.